consider for a moment all that was lost in the Garden of Eden. In that place before the fall, there were at least three things that had been grievously lacking since. There was security. This was the place God made for man, and there were no enemies, no threats. There was provision. God had made all kinds of trees in that garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. He made a river to water that garden. And before the fall, there was no death. In fact, I believe all of creation was so radically different that there was no death on any level and that creation still groans for this initial perfection. But Adam and Eve ate from the one forbidden tree, rebelled against the one obedience God imposed, and in that fall, all security, all provision, and our eternal life itself was lost. So we live in a world of violence, of want, and of death. Gungor sings it this way. The fall, the fall, oh God, the fall of man. The fruit is found in every eye and every hand. Nothing there is nothing yet. In truest form We walk like ghosts upon the earth The ground it groans We live in a world of danger, need, and death. A world of broken relationships, broken hearts, fear, want, and tragic pursuit of all the wrong answers. But God promises that in that day, all of these will be reversed. We said these when we studied Revelation 21, which many of you know is probably my favorite text of Scripture. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. This morning, we get to study one of the texts behind those words, Isaiah 25, 1 through 9. It isn't only the New Testament that promises security, provision, and eternal life. The Old Testament does too, and this is one of the key places. This morning we'll see that God is worthy of praise because in his salvation we are given security, provision, and eternal life, and it's both now and not yet. I've broken the passage into five short pieces. Verse 1 tells us that this description of security, provision, and life is really a result of Isaiah giving God praise. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Between chapter 19, where we were last week, and chapter 25, where we pick up here, Isaiah has continued his descriptions of God's judgment and in some cases God's future mercy on the nations surrounding Israel. But in chapter 24, he begins to describe the judgment of the whole earth. He uses imagery, if we had time to look at it in detail, that would remind us of the kinds of things we read in Revelation last year. This includes verse 21, the punishment of both the evil heavenly beings and the kings of the earth that they are gathered together and thrown in a pit. This also includes the dimming of the sun and the moon, which you remember is an image frequently mentioned by the prophets and in the book of Revelation. So it's in the context of this world-spanning judgment that we reach chapter 25. And it seems to me that Isaiah, processing even as he's recording these revelations, breaks out in spontaneous praise. 
I praise you, I exalt you, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old. You are faithful and sure. Good praise almost always includes a who God is component and a what God has done component. He is faithful and sure he has carried out his plans. But has he? The amazing thing in this praise, the thing we need to imitate, is that Isaiah takes as completed what is only promised. God is going to do all this judgment. God is going to reverse the effects of the fall. But at this point, he hasn't done these things. Yet Isaiah, like the other authors of Scripture, sees these promises as so certain that it's as if they had already happened. There is wisdom and comfort in this. If we are convinced that all that God has done and all that God will do are equally sure, equally true, we can have confidence in the now and calm hope for the not yet. This is why I've long prayed that we as a people would take the events of Scripture as just as real, having just as much impact on us as our own experiences. We ought to believe in the resurrection as if we had seen it. We ought to report the miracles of Scripture as if we were eyewitnesses. We ought to hear the voice of the angel saying, this same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way. We ought to stand with John and hear Jesus say, behold, I am coming soon. The truth of Scripture ought to make it very real to us. And so Isaiah does this. He sees these judgments as fulfilled, this reversal of Eden as absolutely sure. Listen to him talk about it in the past tense, verses 2 to 5. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a stronghold to the poor a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners, the heat as by the shade of a cloud, so that the song of the ruthless is put down. The world is a dangerous, insecure place. But Isaiah sees the sources of all this danger and insecurity all around us coming under God's judgment, and we ourselves coming into God's safety. Now, the city pictured in this verse really represents the fallen world system, which always sets itself up against God. Whether Assyria or Babylon, Berlin or Moscow, Beijing or Tehran, New York or Los Angeles, The cities of the world have always been the focus of worldly culture and of sin, often of oppression and tyranny. Now Isaiah says all of this, and the cultures it represents is a heap, a ruin, a city no more, impossible of rebuilding. All of this reminds us again of the downfall of Babylon in Revelation symbolic of the same fallen world system, its horrific effects on those who live on it, that Babylon gave us strong echoes of our own culture, our own city, the Western culture of godlessness, commercialism, and materialism. And we saw that God will judge those things. Remember Michael Card's song, The Message of One of Revelation's Many Angels? These are God's promises. The world system that has been the birth cesspool of every evil from genocide to sex trafficking 
dictatorship to economic oppression, abuse to simple, utter selfish, selfishness, this world system will in that day be a pile of rubbish, a mud puddle, and then a beach washed clean. But God himself will be a stronghold to the poor and needy, a shelter from the storm, a shade from the heat. These are the rich promises that are often echoed in scripture. The word stronghold could be translated refuge or strength. It's one of many Hebrew words for these things. Psalm 31, in you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. And this is the same word strength in Nehemiah 8. The joy of the Lord is your strength. God's joy is your refuge. I've really felt that in my own life lately. But he's not only our refuge and our strength, he's our shield and our shade. Psalm 121, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The rest of these verses morph and amplify that truth. For the breath of the ruthless, Isaiah says, is like a storm on a wall. The storm can blow on the wall on your refuge all at once, but the wall doesn't move. Next, he says that the noise of these people's oppressors has been like heat in a dry place. But in the same way that the shade of a cloud subdues the heat of the sun, so the songs or victory chants of these oppressors is subdued by God. The point? God is worthy of praise because he is a safe place in a world inherently insecure. And this is now and not yet. Certainly the promise of a holy place of safety, a return to the security of the garden, a city made by God's own hand, this is a tremendous hope. This fallen world will always be challenging to us, disappointing. There will always be events, people, and decisions that grieve us. The promise of a world that has no longer any of this fallenness is a tremendous, precious promise. And yet, it's not all not yet. This refuge, this stronghold, this shade, this shield, you can experience it now. It can be yours in your present distress. God will not solve every distressing situation, but I promise you, he is with you in your distress. And it's just not just my experience that says that. It's the sworn testimony of thousands of saints over thousands of years. The world can't see it, but God is already keeping this promise, already reversing for his people the effects of the fall. The same is too, true in these other areas. Verse 6 addresses provision. On this mountain... The Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, rich food full of marrow, aged wine, well-refined. We've already talked and studied about Isaiah's mountain. Isaiah 2 tells us that it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come saying, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. In Isaiah 11, we learn that they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God will be worshipped on Zion by all nations because, as the book of Hebrews says, when we come to that mountain, to Zion, we come to Jesus. And what happens on that mountain? A feast. 
God has always had a thing about feasts. The first element of God's law given to Moses was the Passover meal, the Passover feasts. In fact, feasts are almost the third leg of the law. You have moral laws like the Ten Commandments. You have ceremonial laws for sacrifice and offering. And then you have the prescriptions of the feasts, extended prescriptions. Prescriptions of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, trumpets, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles, all of them commemorating God's provision or celebrating his presence and his work. And these feasts, Scripture tells us, point forward to a great and glorious feast in God's presence in that day. Isaiah 55 invites us, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. God promises a feast. Jesus himself looks forward to that feast. In Matthew 8, he's commending the faith of a Roman soldier, faith unlike that found in Israel, and he says, I tell you, Many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's a feast. When he celebrates Passover with his disciples, he says he will not eat it again until it's fulfilled, a feast fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And that moment seems to arrive in chapter 19 of Revelation when Jesus and all the redeemed celebrate the wedding supper, the wedding feast of the Lamb. But the feast is even more than a literal feast, though it is that. It's also a symbol of the abundance of God's provision that was lost in the fall. Kicked out of the garden, Adam had to toil for his food to drag it from the earth by the sweat of his brow. That was one of the main elements of the curse. Now the curse is reversed. We are giving the finest food ever, the best wine ever, maybe even better than the wine Jesus made in Capernaum, and God richly provides for his people. And again, in many ways, we're already receiving this, this provision. Jesus says to the crowds, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me now, present tense, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. If we believe in Jesus, we're already participating in the feast that he offers. He himself is the feast. And in him, our needs in this world become secondary. He says, so don't be anxious saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to what you receive. So in Jesus we find security, in Jesus we find provision, and finally in the ultimate reversal of the fall, in Jesus we find life, verses 7 and 8. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. God will swallow up death. It's an amazing image. Reminds me of the biblical image of the cup of God's wrath and of Jesus saying that he will drink the cup that the Lord is giving him. He drank the cup of wrath, the cup of death. He swallowed it down for us. Death is described here as the covering cast over all peoples, the veil spread over all nations. Some translations use the word shroud there. It's a burial covering, and it's over every nation because death is the great equalizer, the universal calamity. The book of Hebrews tells us that since we, his children, are flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, became flesh and blood so that through his death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. 
We are all slaves of death, bound to meet that last enemy in the end. But Isaiah says, on this mountain, and remember, it's Mount Zion, the place where Jesus died and rose. On this mountain, God will swallow up death forever. I want you to think about that. Sometimes the doctrine of eternal life is said to be a New Testament invention. The Old Testament didn't conceive such a thing, we're told. But I ask you, if death is destroyed forever, what's left? Life. Life forever. Eternal life. It doesn't show up very often, but when it does in the Old Testament, it's very clear. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Job says, though the worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He's looking forward to resurrected life. Michael Gungor says this well and biblically. destroy death through Jesus and will wipe away tears from all faces. In this fallen world, we weep. We weep for the injustices. We weep for the losses. We weep for the partings. We weep for broken relationships. We weep for longings unfulfilled and beauty unsustained. We weep for the children in pain and the children unborn for the young men broken and maimed in body and mind through war, for the young women broken and crushed through the lust of the uncaring, for those who starve while others feast, for those who suffer, thrive, for those who pursue folly, and for those whose minds cannot process the reality of this fallen world. We weep. We weep. But in that day, all tears will be wiped away and all causes of sorrow will vanish as the darkness vanishes at dawn. But that can only happen because the reproach of this people he will take away from all the earth. To reproach is to express disappointment in or displeasure with someone for conduct that is blameworthy or in need of change. So it's a noun reproach is the cause or occasion of that blame or displeasure. In short, God frequently says, the people's sin have brought reproach on them, on him. By sin, they bring dishonor to his name in the sight of nations and in the sight of both angels and demons. But if this reproach is to be removed, it has to be through the forgiveness of sin and the healing of the sinful nature. That is the reversal of the root problem behind the fall, the sin that led to the expulsion from the garden and from security, provision, and life. So to remove this reproach, God must have dealt with the sin of his fallen people. This is why he sent Jesus to bear our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. As forgiven, redeemed, and renewed people, the remote reproach of our sin has been removed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And this too is now and not yet. 
though our sins have been fully paid for, our renewal is not yet fully complete, and death, the last enemy, is not yet fully defeated. Both of these things wait for that day in which the dead in Christ will rise to new and eternal life, and death and Satan will finally, permanently, be confined to the pit, to the lake of fire. Again, we saw all this in Revelation. But like the death of death and the wiping away of tears, this reality was foreseen thousands of years earlier by Isaiah. I've really been enjoying the indelible grace song that we're about to sing. It's called Until the Daybreak. The poetry is great. The third verse especially feels like Isaiah. For the light beyond the darkness When the rain of sin is done When the storm has ceased its raging And the haven has been won For the joy beyond the sorrow Joy of the eternal for that day. Yet at the very same time, we're living in the dawn of that day. Our final verse captures that tension, Isaiah 25, 9. It will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We have been saved. Jesus has died and has risen. We have believed on him, placed our trust on him to rescue us from our sins, to renew us toward righteousness. We have received his cleansing, his renewal, his Holy Spirit, the adoption of sons, and the first taste now of an eternal life unending. In one sense, we can affirm this verse fully and unreservedly now. In fact, the word waited in the verse could be translated hoped, or even trusted. Think about it that way. This is our God. We have trusted in him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have trusted in him. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. <laughs> we can say that now. You and I can be glad and rejoice in the salvation that comes now by trusting, and yet we still live in that fallen world. We wait for his return. We wait for his shout. We wait for the defeat of death. We wait for a feast and a wedding. Andrew Peterson has a series of bridges in his song, Carry the Fire, that capture this waiting. I like all the others this morning. I'm not going to play this one. But the first bridge in the song says, And we dream in the night of a city descending with the sun in the center and a peace unending. We're waiting. Second bridge says, and we dream in the night of a king and a kingdom where joy writes the songs and the innocent sing them. I love that. And the third one says, and we dream in the night of a feast and the wedding and the groom in his glory when the bride is made ready. We're waiting, waiting for the culmination, waiting for the death of death. We still live in a fallen world where everything is broken, but God is not going to leave it that way. He's going to reverse the fall. He's going to restore the security of the garden in the new heavens and the new earth. He's going to restore provision of the garden, we will lack no good thing, and he's going to restore life, eternal life, through the death of death, through the forgiveness of sins, through the sacrifice of his sons, life forevermore.